Right, <laughs> thinking about what to talk about this morning, because we're going to get into the Bible now. <clears throat> and uh, I really felt I wanted to talk about prayer. And it's not my, you know, not my big hot topic. I'm normally the mission guy, right? I talk about mission and going for Jesus and, and reaching those who don't know Jesus. But I really believe, and I've often, people have said, have you got a job description? And, and flipping it, I'll say, yes, it's got two lines, my job description. First line is, keep mission hot. You know, keep Christ-centered mission hot for the poor and for those who don't know Jesus. But the second line is, keep prayer hot. And my job and Martin and Linda's job and every other church leader or ministry leader, our job is to test those two things. Sniff the temperature. How hot are we for mission? Not just about gathering on a Sunday morning, but transforming society in his name. But also, how much are we fueling it through prayer? I'm so delighted you got a prayer conference next Saturday. I hope many of you will come and you'll be fueled for prayer. But like me and like Martin and Linda and like many others, we recognize that the secret to Jesus' life and ministry was his prayer life with the Father. In Luke chapter 11, we read these words that will be so familiar to us. And in some ways, it's a scary thing to talk on this passage because how many great words have been said about this? But I'm going to have a go. Look at Luke chapter 11 if you've got a Bible or on your phone or whatever. One day... Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. And as I say, it's a bit daunting to speak on these famous words, but... I think the Lord could have something to say to us. So let's pray. Lord, as we look at this model prayer, maybe the most beautiful prayer ever prayed from your lips, I pray you'll speak to every person in this church this morning. Holy Spirit, have your way with us. Don't let us miss it. Amen. Amen. So the disciples came to Jesus and what you need to know is Luke chapter 10, the chapter before this, the disciples been out on mission for the first time. For, for months and months, they were trained by Jesus and he, they watched the way he did ministry. And then in Luke chapter 10, he got them together two by two and sent them out in his name. And they came back blown away. And they said, Lord, it works basically. When we go out doing your stuff in your name, we see the same results. And the Bible says Jesus was full of joy through the Holy Spirit. He was literally jumping for joy. And it was like, it's going to work. Through these bunch of jokers, through these very ordinary people going out, doing my work, my way. And the disciples came back from that incredible breakthrough season. And they got Jesus to one side. And they'd had such a brilliant time on mission and seen healings and demons cast out and incredible things happen. Salvation all over the place. And they said, Lord, did they say, Lord, we want to step up in our prophetic life. We want to step up in our preaching. We've seen some healings. We want to do more healings. No, you know what they said? Lord, teach us to Lord teach us to pray maybe the most important question that's ever been asked Lord teach us to pray unless we learn how to pray we're never really going to see the transformation we want unless we learn how to pray we're never going to see the kingdom come in the way we want and, and broken lives truly restored to the measure we want to see. We're never going to see Jesus really honoured in the northeast unless some people learn how to pray. So they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And on the back of that request, Jesus brought them these famous familiar words, which we call the Lord's Prayer. Of course, they're not, it's not the Lord's Prayer at all. It's the believer's prayer. Jesus didn't need to pray, forgive us our sins. He was the only man who's ever lived who didn't need to pray, forgive us our sins because he never sinned. We're the people who need to pray. It's our prayer. Jesus said, when you pray, when you pray, this is the way you're meant to pray. And it's an incredible model for prayer. And it starts with what? Pray our Father. Did you know that every prayer Jesus ever prayed started that way? Every prayer we've got in the Bible, anyway, New Testament, apart from one. Every prayer 
Jesus ever prayed. Now, in the Old Testament, Jewish people had a name for God, Yahweh. It was the name he'd given himself. He told Moses, this is my name, I am. It was a name so holy that they wouldn't even allow the name to pass across their lips. Jesus comes along and he said, when you pray, I want you to name the name of God, Dad, Abba, Father. It's like, actually, it is Abba. It's literally, the word he uses, the, name, the word that a little child would use towards their father. And I imagine, remember being in Israel and hearing some little Hebrew kid saying to his, his dad, Abba. And it was, touch me deep inside. That's the invitation. That's the personal relationship. Our Father, every time Jesus ever prayed, he prayed Abba, apart from once. When he was hanging on the cross, taking the punishment for our sins, he didn't pray our Father because the beautiful relationship between the Son and the Father was shattered on the cross. He couldn't pray Father on the cross because he was taking the punishment for our sins. He was separate from God. That, that was what horrified Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. It wasn't like the thought of the, the beating and the whipping and the nails and all the torture that went around the cross. That was just picture language of being separate from God. What a terrible thing. The thing that horrified Jesus and made him sweat like great drops of blood was being separate from his father. He couldn't pray for the one time in his life. Abba, he couldn't pray, Father. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? That's what he prayed. And no answer came, but I'll tell you why God the Father abandoned God the Son. Why that beautiful, perfect, intimate relationship where Jesus said, I don't do anything but my Father tells me to. It's me and the Father, we're one. Yeah. We're like in this beautiful, intimate relationship, unfettered access to the Father. And I just go and spend time with him and it's beautiful. That relationship was shattered on the cross. Why did he abandon? Why did God the Father abandon Jesus to that? Because of his great love for you. Because of Jesus' great love for you. He took the punishment that you and I deserve. In some ways, I should just finish it there and pray and say, come on, let's stand up and go for it. How amazing is Jesus? That the way's open. And as Jesus, so he said that. And then for hours on the cross, he suffered. He went through hell so me and you don't have to. Right. And once he'd been through that horror on the cross, he screamed out, it is finished. Yes. Yes. Literally what they would stamp on a legal document in Jesus' day when the bill was fully paid. Nobody can come after me for this bill because bang, it's finished. And as he shouted out, it is finished. You know what the Bible says happened? And we heard about it twice already in this service. The curtain in the temple was torn in two. In the temple in Jerusalem was a, 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 a curtain as wide as the span of your hand. It was 30 foot high. It was highly embroidered and it protected the people from the Holy of Holies. Only one man once a year was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, the high priest on the Day of Atonement, to sacrifice on the altar. He went through all this rigmarole to get there, smeared himself in blood and fasted and prayed. And you know, the high priest, when he went, he was the only man who was allowed in, had, had a, a rope tied around his legs so that if he died in the presence of God, he could be pulled out because nobody else was allowed. It was so holy. As Jesus died on the cross and paid the price fully, you know what happened? The curtain temple was torn in two from top, I like that, to bottom. And it's like God saying, because of what Jesus did, the way's open. You can have access to the Father. You, not only you can go in, but the Spirit can be poured out all over the world. You can know that relationship. If you'll just receive the forgiveness that Jesus offers today. You can be in that intimate relationship with your heavenly Father. Anybody excited about that? We should be. We can pray our Father, but not just our Father, our Father in heaven. He's the all-powerful God who's holding all things together by his powerful word. I told you that eight years ago, um, I did this thousand kilometer bike ride with Matthew Kimpton Smith and a bunch of other men fitter than me. 
I'm so mad that I did it again this year. I think we're probably so desperate for money for the message trust. I did it again this year, and I was out on a training trip in February this year, and I cycled out to Jodrell Bank. Anybody heard of Jodrell Bank? This massive uh, telescope on the outskirts of Manchester in Holmes Chapel. And I was absolutely exhausted. So I saw there was a cafe. So I pulled into Jodrell Bank for a coffee, and I was so glad I did. Because on a wall... Uh, like there's a graphic in the cafe at Jodrell Bank, and it's amazing. And it, it, it's various pictures. There's a picture of the moon, and it says it takes one and a half, one and a quarter seconds for the light of the moon at 300,000 miles a second. That's how that's the speed of light. It takes one and a quarter seconds for the light of the moon to reach us. So we don't really see the moon. We see the moon in one and a quarter seconds after. Do you get it? takes that long to travel to us. For the sun that's 93 million miles away, it takes eight and a half minutes. So we see the sun eight and a half minutes and there's all these graphics along the wall. Now, do you know how far, how, how long it takes for the, the, the furthest stars that we can see through the Hubble telescope? The light at 300,000 miles a second. You know how long it takes to reach Earth? You are, no, don't you? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Two and a half billion years. Two and a half billion years traveling through space at the speed of light. I mean, that's how vast the universe is. That's how glorious the universe is. And that's not the furthest star. That's just the furthest one we can see. It's this incredible, infinite galaxy upon galaxy, this vast universe. And the Bible says Jesus hung all that together. The sun is his handiwork. And it says the heavens declare the glory of God. And they do if you've just got eyes to see. That's our God. Surely he's big enough for your little financial issue, or your health pressure, or your personnel situation, or whatever it is, whatever's going on in your world, as if you can't come to that God who's your dad, who cares for you intimately. But he's also in the heavens. He's so powerful. And on the back of that, on the back of getting those two things gloriously in tension, Jesus says, this is your way to, this is the way I want you to pray. When you come to prayer, this is the way I want you to pray. And he starts with three requests about God and his glory, followed by three requests regarding to us and our needs. I'm telling you, if you could pray like this, it would transform your life. If your first thought when you come to prayer is God and his glory, Focusing on God and his glory and his great name, first and foremost. And then you're out of that place, bringing your request to God. What am I like? I'm like lots of people in this church. I'm straight in with my requests. Oh God, we need this situa visa situation sorted. Oh, my daughter's out on mission. Oh, this person's sick. Oh, that person's sick. Oh, and I love you, God. Yeah. No, no. Jesus did it so differently. He started off first request. Hallowed be your name. What a way to start a prayer. It's a missional prayer. God, I want your name to be seen as great. I want your beautiful name, the name of Jesus, the name of our God to be seen as glorious and wonderful. I mean, does it really bother any Christians in this place that the name of our beautiful Jesus, our Savior, is a curse word for most people? Does that not grieve you? Does it not upset you that at nine o'clock on BBC One, people can literally say, and I've heard them say it, Jesus effing Christ. And that's okay. That's not okay, is it? That's not okay. That that's the way they use the name of Jesus. And I think it's something to do with the devil. Because if he can make Jesus' name seem dirty and low and a curse word, he'll do everything. So we need a people who sh let the world know how holy and marvellous and beautiful our Jesus is who are absolutely passionate, first and foremost, that his name will be hallowed, his name will be honoured. We'll be able to see the things that only Jesus can do and just praise his great name. So our pre passion in prayer should be, hallowed be your name. But also, your kingdom come. Just imagine what it would be like if Jesus fully answered that prayer across the northeast. Imagine if Jesus was truly king and his kingly reign was seen and established. Imagine what this neighborhood would be like. And we're a people who can pray that in faith. I told you about my, you know, 
Psalm 37 moment in that car park. And if I had another hour, I could tell you about revival promise after revival promise that I'm carrying for the work of the message trust. I know God's spoken. I know God said we're going to see so much more. And there's so much more. His, his kingdom coming so much more. You know, my great granddad was first Salvation Army missionary to India. And he went out on a boat for three months and lived amongst the poor and Captain Robert Hawthorne, epic. But have you literally read about those early days of the Salvation Army? When it was like crazy all-night prayer and the spirit falling amongst the poor. And in Newcastle, for a period, crime stopped through the work of the Salvation Army. Because God was doing so much. I want to see that. It's called the kingdom coming. I'm glad churches I'm working with are growing. I'm glad broken people are coming to Christ. I'm glad offenders are meeting Jesus and becoming ex-offenders, going from the problem to the answer. But I want to see a move of God so much that the kingdom truly comes and society is transformed. Don't you? Of course, we're not going to see the full measure until we see Jesus face to face and we're in heaven. Where there'll be no disease, poverty, injustice, pain. There'll be no broken relationships. But we can contend for that in our neighbourhoods and put legs on it and go out there. We're going to do everything we can to see your beautiful kingdom come. And bit by bit by bit, we see that ushered in as we pray this kind of prayer, as we presence the gospel, as we, we live large for Jesus and we proclaim the good news. And it said, on earth as in heaven thing. Pray it. Start thinking about what heaven's going to be like. It's going to be incredible. Free of all the baggages and chips. But Jesus is saying, pray this thing. He didn't just say it, tantalize it. He said, because we can start to see it more and more and more. True revival. My friend, Rob White, who's one of our trustees and has been a friend, he was one of our very first trustees, probably a first actually, going back like, 30 plus years at the message. As a young man, well, youngish, he was, a, whatever, chief executive of British Youth for Christ. And Rob told me this, that the only time he's ever heard the audible voice of God was he was woken up like middle of the night and he heard God say, you're going to see a major move of my spirit amongst young people in your lifetime. And he's held on to that. And I, and I Rob's not an airhead. I totally believe him. I totally believe that God spoke to Rob. The good news is I think Rob's 78 now. (laughs) Can't be long. (laughs) Can't be that long. Come on, Lord. I want to believe for a major move of God in my lifetime. It's what we're living for. The kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Should be our obsession. And once we pray those kind of prayers, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we'll end up praying very different kind of prayers for ourselves. And our prayers will probably be a lot more about our needs rather than our want or our greed. You understand? Because our passion will be the kingdom of God. And we'll be kind of praying, give us this day our daily bread. Not fish and chips and fillet steak. (laughs) You know, just enough, whatever you need. You know, you know what we need, God. Just provide our needs so we can serve you well. Christian life is meant to actually be a daily walk of faith. And in some ways, I miss those early days of the message. When it was just crazy day by day faith. Climbing the mountain to paying the salaries. And then seeing like time and again the day before. You know, here we go again. Oh, pray by faith that God will provide our needs. And God spectacularly Walk of faith, what a place to be. Remember, you know Matt and Beth Redman? Well, Beth Redman used to be in the Worldwide Message Tribe with me. And, uh, but anyway, she, um, she went off and married Matt, Matt Redman, and then, then she came back. And she was involved when there was like, say, five people employed at the message. And I remember coming back, and we had a little office above a rectory in there. And I had a, I had a little, a, 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 my, my office was no bigger than this platform. And I used to have curtains, which I had to pull if I was preparing a message. I never had to be quiet, you know, like a bit cheesy. But anyway, but Beth Redmond came to visit us recently. And she went in our message headquarters, like 200 staff and all this stuff. And she went, I can't believe it. You've got Coke machines. <laughs> she was like, 
Coke machines. When we were these nutters who were walking this step of faith, one day at a time, seeing God provide. And that, but, oh, help us to walk that walk of faith. And just rejoice, Lord, if you give us our daily bread, enough for today. Keep trusting you for tomorrow. If you give us more than that, hallelujah, let us be generous people in everything we do. And then the next thing he says, wow, and I really believe God's going to speak to someone. And I just feel this coming to this church today. He says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Something so powerful here that some people who are carrying deep hurts need to hear today. And it's this, that our true understanding of the gospel is revealed in how we forgive others. We can have no true understanding of the gospel unless we fully understand how much we've been forgiven. And then in light of that, get power through Jesus' spirit to forgive others. There's a book, I've not even read the book, but all I can do is recommend the title. It's by a fellow called John Bevere, and he's written a book called The Bait of Satan. You know, like a bait that gets in your mouth and pulls you away from God. You know what the bait of Satan is, according to John Bevere? Offense. Offense. So many people are walking around with offense, and it's screwing them up, and they're drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. I heard a guy who went to speak at a church, and he was a big church like this, and, there were, and he was a bit freaked out because he was on the platform. He's looking over here, and there's one guy, and he's looking over here, and there's a guy who looked exactly identical on the other side of the church. It's a bit like this. And they both had miserable, screwed-up faces. And he said to the vicar, that was really weird. He said, there's, there's, there's those two guys, they look really identical, and they both look so miserable. He said, oh, yeah. That's two identical twins who go to our church and they had a fallen out. They had a fallout 25 years ago and they've not spoken. <laughs> and the twins, identical twins, and they come to church every week and stewing and brewing because the other guy's on the other side of the room. Come on, people. Yeah. But I know that's easy for me to say because I've not got deep, deep hurts and I've not had somebody do some of the terrible things to me that have been done to you but honestly we lead a church now that was never part of the plan but I help lead a church and our church is full of like 80% brand new Christians many out of addiction and brokenness and pain and virtually every week we see people come to Jesus and watch their demeanor change as they forgive others as they choose to forgive others. And sometimes with the name in the name in tears in our ministry time, I choose to forgive this man who's done this terrible thing to me or whatever it is. I choose to forgive as we forgive. Now you can't do that. That's literally impossible. But nothing's impossible for God and he can give you power and suddenly you're walking in freedom and I just felt one of my big takeaways from today could be you could walk out of this place free because you choose to forgive. You choose to forgive the way you've been forgiven when you've done nothing right, nothing to deserve it. And there's power in that. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who, forgive, uh, those who have sinned against us. And then finally, something that I think I've been praying more than ever in the last months. Lead us not into temptation. You know, I've literally watched some of my closest friends in ministry have catastrophic falls, and it continues on, even this week. Stuff you just couldn't make up. You know, people have been my heroes in the faith. People I've shared platforms with dozens of times whose, whose lives are now a train wreck, and they've given in to temptation in different areas. And it's horrible. And literally, I, I was thinking uh, this week, you know, these people who've lost the marriages and the, the ministries and the reputation and sometimes even lost the kids, the relationship with the kids because they've just gone so far off track. I'm like, I'm like, is there anything on this earth that you could give me to swap with them? And some of it's so stupid, you know. They just gave in and then once they'd given in, they got away with it, so they gave in again. And it's like, could you give me like a... Nobody's going to, but could you give me like a hundred million pound super yacht on an island in the Caribbean and a billion pounds in my bank? You know, what would be the most extravagant thing? There's not a chance. Not a chance that you'd swap with those people. 
who've lost the things that really count. You get me? Satan is so sneaky. And that's why Jesus says, pray. Lead us not into temptation. He goes on in Matthew's gospel to say, lead us away from the day of evil. You know, that day of massive temptation where you're not prayed up and you're going through stress in your life and you're giving. I don't want to be that guy. I want to go all the way for Jesus. Do you get me? We need people who have good hearts, who keep going to the end. And that's all. That's the secret to a successful life. I'm going to write a book, I think. It's only got two chapters. How to live a successful life. The first chapter is have a good heart. Heart for Jesus and a heart for people. And the other one is keep going when other people give up. Because Jesus said that, didn't he, in the parable of the sower? If you've got a good and a noble heart and you persevere to the end, you will receive a hundredfold harvest. And a hundredfold harvest is a revival harvest. I want to be that guy who keeps going with a good heart all the way to the end. So I hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's what I want. You know the joy of the Lord is? You know the joy of Jesus is? Heaven populated. The poor blessed, people uplifted, people living great lives who are living horrible lives. That's a joy to Jesus. Well, I want to give him joy. I want to join in his joy. And when I get to heaven, I want there to be a lot of joy there because I'm hearing the stories. Don't you? It's the only thing that makes life worth living. So what a prayer. His name honored. His kingdom extended. His will done. Our sins forgiven. Our needs supplied by faith and our temptations overcome. It's called a victorious Christian life. It's the life that God's got for you. It's the best life. It's life to the full. It's the only life worth living. It's the Jesus life. Let's pray. Oh Lord, pray that, that maybe this prayer will be different for us even this week. I've got so familiar with it. But I pray for a bunch of people who long for your name to be hallowed, for your kingdom to come, for earth to break into heaven, for people trusting you for daily provision, and going for it, walking in forgiveness, and overcoming temptation whenever it comes. Help us to be those people, Jesus. Just, just for a sec, I want to do one more thing before I hand back to the band. Just allow that thing, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you about lack of forgiveness. Maybe there's a couple of people here today who just need to just come to the ministry team at the end of this service and say, please pray for me. Not been able to do it so far, but I want power to forgive. Forgive this person that's hurt me deeply because you've forgiven me. Because I want to walk in freedom. But I don't want to come all the way from Manchester. Just keep in that place of prayer, would you, for a sec? Because I want to have a little holy moment now before I step down. And maybe, because maybe, you know, a gathering this side, there's every chance there's people here who aren't Christians yet. You don't have that unfettered relationship with God because your sins are in the way. That's what stops us. If you could, if you could be so holy that you could sin three times a day. Now, if you're anything like Andy Hawthorne, it's more like 300 times. But if you could sin three times a day, by the time you stood before God, there'd be 70,000 reasons you can't go to heaven. And Jesus was punished on the cross for every sin you've ever committed. And he says, anyone who comes to me, there's no way I'll turn them away. And if you come to Jesus, he will forgive your sins. He'll remove the barrier. The way will be open to God. And you can know his power and his strength. If you're willing to turn away from what's wrong in your life and give your life to Christ, I promise you, You'll be what the Bible calls being saved. <laughs> You'll be saved from all the mess and all the broken, saved from separation from God. You'll know his power in your life. And I've seen it as I travel around the world. I've seen it time and again. When I just give people this little opportunity at the end of a service and they say, yes, God, the difference it makes. You've heard some of the stories today. So if that's you today, if you're not a Christian and you want to be a Christian, you don't have to have all your ducks in a row. You don't have to have, understand everything. You just need to come to Jesus and want to make him Lord of your life. Maybe, you, maybe you've come along and you, it's like you don't even know if you're a Christian anymore. You've fallen so far away, but you want to come back to God. You want to know what you knew in the past. I'd just like you to, I'm going to pray a little prayer and I'd just like you to raise your hand in this church, not to me, but to God, just because it's good to set a bit of a mark on it. I've seen that as well. 
Just say, yes, here I am, Lord. Don't forget me. And he will never forget you. So let me just pray. Lord, I pray in this place now, salvation will spring up. New life will spring up. You'll have your way. If we need to do business with you now, God, give us courage, I pray. Amen. If anybody need to do that, just raise your hand to God, not to me. Just raise your hand to God. Yeah. A few people in the back row. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful girls. Come on. Yeah. You know, I sometimes say it's worth crawling across broken glass from Manchester for four or five people who are like saying yes to Jesus. But anybody else, don't miss this moment. I'm not going to make you out, bring you out the front and make you do anything embarrassing. I'm just going to pray a prayer together as church. For anybody else, don't go home and say, oh, my heart was beating and I didn't want to, didn't want to do it, didn't want to embarrass myself. Just go for it. Come to Jesus. You'll never regret it, I promise you. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, wonderful. Thank you, Lord. Oh, let's all stand together. Let's pray a prayer of full surrender to Jesus. Especially if you raise your hand right then. A bunch of people around the church. If you raise your hand, make this your own prayer in your head and in your heart. But you know what? You don't have to raise your hand to become a Christian. <laughs> you just need to want to follow Christ and want to make him Lord of your life and turn away from what's wrong in your life with his strength. So we're going to pray a prayer, a prayer of full surrender. Pray it out loud after me. Everybody joining in. Let's pray this. Dear Lord Jesus, please take over my life. Forgive every sin and give me a fresh start. With your help, Lord, I'll live all out for you for the rest of my days. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that you're alive today. Be alive in me by your Holy Spirit and welcome me in heaven as you've promised. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Amen. Amen.